make your life a masterpiece, my dear friends. Hi, I'm Michael Heideman. I'm here with WGN Radio with the man himself, Mr. Tony Robbins. Tony, so great to see you. Thank you. Congratulations on the movie. How's everything been going in Austin so far? Oh, I've had a blast here. It's such a cool and hip place, fun place. And it was so great to watch the film with people. I'd only seen one cut before, but to see it with a live audience was really amazing. Yeah, it, the impact that you see when I w- was watching it from from my seat was everyone was very intently watching. It's like I'm getting a lesson from Tony Robbins himself yeah. almost. Well, my favorite part, though, is when they, like, no, no, no. You know when I had the woman, you know the scene where I had the woman make a phone call to the yeah. woman. Oh, no, yes. the scene. Everybody's squirming in their seats. But then, you know, watching them laugh their tails off and many of them crying, you know, throughout the film. Mm-hmm. Uh, seeing all the, the wealth of emotions there. It was, it's very much like going to a concert film. It's a six-day concert that... Uh, the director, you know, Joe Berlinger, just did a genius job of making an hour and 50 minutes. I mean, I don't know how he did it. Yeah, so what was your connection to Joe? What's this relationship that you guys kind of built where you trusted your, you know, your vision with him? Yeah, he. I met him socially. We have a mutual friend who's a brilliant director and movie uh, director. Mm-hmm. And I met Joe, and I just really liked him. Mm-hmm. And I was, became a fan of his documentaries and his works. And so I, I felt that he had some things in his life he needed to deal with, and he wasn't being very clear about it himself. So I said, why don't you come to an event? He was very skeptical. And uh, but he was encouraged by everybody else saying you got to go, you got to go. So he came. And he, I thought he was going to be an observer. Yeah. And on the first day, I went, "You, sir." And I called <laughs> on him. He's like, "Oh my god!" Uh, and it was a life. Tra- it changed his life. And so for the next two years, he tried to convince him to make a documentary. And I wasn't interested because I thought it would be too disruptive mm-hmm. to the audience. And I was also just worried. You know, how can you have integrity in a six day program and really show what happened in, in two hours? But uh, we made a deal. It was really simple. I said, "If you're willing to let me cut you off, if you." Get in the way of the experience. I got to shut this down. He yeah, I'm willing to take that risk. And I said, my other thing is, you got to wait a year because I want you to follow up and see these people and interview them and find out where they are a year from now. Because most people think change is hard, and if you do it fast, it's not going to last. And mm-hmm. I know from 39 years that's total bullshit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, I, he did, and you know, you saw the film. You saw people's lives at the end of the year. It was mind boggling how they changed. Yeah, these interventions that you put through with these people, you can see it in their eyes and in their body language, the fact that you are changing their lives. I mean, it well, must they're be... changing them, but I'm helping. <laughs> exactly. You're yeah. facilitating the yeah. way that they change their lives. What's that feeling like? Like, what's that kind of connection that you feel between these people that you kind of push them towards this this better future? I, I love on them. You know, I love people, and I I'm, I wouldn't do what I'm doing unless I was, I was a driven, crazy son of a gun. <laughs> yeah. and I think you can see that. I do 12, 14-hour days, and mm-hmm. I'm not doing that for my health. I'm doing it because I want to take people deep. I think we live... Most people's unhappiness is because we live in a world where we live at a very shallow level now. You know, people think their Facebook friends are their friends. I know some of your friends on Facebook, but a friendship is something deeper than that, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I, I really want to take people on a journey, and I kind of fall in love with these people, and, you know, you watch the film, I don't hide my emotions what I feel. Mm-hmm. That's true. And uh, that's, a, that's a really good point that you brought up. You're on stage for 10, 15 hours at a time. Yeah. How do you maintain that kind of stamina? Well, I, I train my body to do it, obviously, and, and that group is easy. It's only 2,500 people. My average event's nine or 10,000 people. Wow. And so i got to hold that audience for 50 hours in one weekend to give you an idea. And most people won't go for a three-hour movie with that, but somebody spent $300 million on it and they leave. So I just got my voice and some music mm-hmm. and my ability to direct things. But when you meet people's deepest psychological and spiritual needs, mm-hmm. time disappears. It's kind of like you know, a minute feels like eternity when you're hating what you're doing. When you're loving it, when all your needs are met, time disappears. And so mm-hmm. I'm able to take people on these journeys that most people, like Oprah came and she said, Tony, I love you dearly, but there's no way I can sit anywhere more than two and a half hours. And 12 hours later, she's standing on a chair looking at the camera going, this is the greatest experience of my life. <laughs> Usher, same thing. It's like, Tony, I just, you know, he doesn't have a lot of attention span for something of this nature usually. Mm-hmm. But, you know, four days later, he's totally into it. So I found a way to meet people's needs. And when you do that, it's incredibly fulfilling. It's fulfilling for me too. I, I don't run out of energy because there's so much energy I'm expressing and so much I'm receiving from the audience as well. You know, I'm, I'm a recipient of their seeing them so happy. Mm-hmm. You, you, you can feel that and kind of go from within outward almost. Yes, exactly right. It, was there any one person that really touched you, you know, very, very deeply? And how did you help them, like, through these interventions? Well, in the film, probably the one that touched me the most would probably be the woman Dawn, who was part of the Children of God cult mm-hmm. down in South America, where they were literally raised to believe that they're, they're uh, as being a child of God, they're supposed to have sex with the elders in the community when they're 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. It's insane. Yeah. And so she was brutally, you know, sexually abused most of her life until she was 12. Mm-hmm. 
And then she tried to keep her brother, her sister had committed suicide, she tried to keep her other sister healthy, her brother healthy, her mom. And she came there like, you know, it was the end of her life as far as she was concerned. Um, so when I asked who's suicidal, there's a night, you know, people listening probably don't know this, but I have a night where I say, who's suicidal? Because whenever you're on 2,500 people, the average ratio is there's 12 people that are suicidal. Yeah. And so I go handle all those suicides. But she was one of the most intense ones. I was not quite prepared for that. I was deeply moved to see her transform. I, I loved that part of the movie, by the way. it was You can see this kind of emotion with the music swelling and everything. It was a yeah. really cool part. And it's it's very kind of yourself to be able to speak to these people. Now, you talked a little bit in the movie about the fact that you were pushed to create this Tony Robbins, yeah. you know, to transform yourself. Yes. What was that moment or collection of moments that made you do this? You're right, it's a collection of moments. Most people think it's a moment, but I think, it, you know, my life has been one of continuous growth. So, but I think early on, you know, my mom was a really beautiful soul and I know she loved me. I wouldn't be who I am without her. I talk about that in the film. That if my mom, my mom was very physically abusive, smashed my head against the wall, probably bled, put liquid soap down my throat saying I was lying when I wasn't lying. And I'm the oldest of three, so I became a practical psychologist to be able to deal with her and my brother and sister not get hurt. And, but it also made me, I had so much suffering, I don't want to see anybody else suffer. So mm -hmm. early in my life, I decided I would never let this happen to anybody. And I, you know, took a speed reading class and said, I'm going to read a book a day and, you know, read 700 books in seven years and do a book a day. But I, I started applying things. And the more knowledge I got, the more I applied it to myself. And, you know, in high school, I was Mr. Solution. You have a problem, I have a solution, especially if you're a girl, I'm extra motivated. <laughs> yeah, I bet it's not. But, but, but so there was that stage. And then later there was a stage when I started turning around athletes or when I started taking people with lifetime phobias who'd been in therapy seven years. And I would challenge their psychiatrist on national radio in those days and then mm -hmm. TV. And I'd say, give me your worst patient. I'll handle them right now in an hour. Mm -hmm. And that's how I built my career, by getting results. And then I started the coaching industry. There was no coaching industry. The coaching was a sports term. But I used it because I was an athlete and my coaches were not better than I was, but they helped me because they saw what I couldn't see. I was in the forest, right? They're outside the forest. And so that was another stage. And then when I started coaching, you know, Mother Teresa and Nelson Mandela and yeah. President Clinton, you know, so there have been stages along the way where my confidence obviously grew. Mm -hmm. Now, I... Being a communicator myself, I mean, working in radio, language is extremely important. And yes. I see it in your movie that, you know, language is important to you. You use a lot of crass words yes. to get the, your point across and everything. They're taboo words. Taboo words. There's a great book you might find interesting. It's called Taboo Words. I read it when I was 20. It, was, it changed my life. It was written by a psychiatrist who had studied Freud. And Freud was a very messed up guy. Mm -hmm. You know, he was a cocaine addict. He thought everybody wanted their mother because he did. Um, but he was a genius in understanding that when you want to make a change, and you fail to change, it's because your conscious mind wants one thing, your unconscious wants another. Mm -hmm. And you got to dig into the unconscious. So he used words to provoke. Um, most people, when you say, how's it going? They go, oh, pretty good, you know, better than dead. <laughs> you yeah, know? yeah. They're, they're not pretty good. If you, you and I were to use more direct language, you'd say, you're screwed, or, you know, maybe even an F word. And so what I learned is every word, every culture has taboo words. Mm -hmm. So if I say, you know, she has a nice butt, or she has a nice ass, mm -hmm. or in UK, she's a nice bum. Mm -hmm. They're all the same device. Mm -hmm. You know, if you say penis or cock, well, that has a very big difference on your audience, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so they're the same thing, though. It makes no difference. It's just the taboo words. So I use taboo words in a very scientific way to jolt somebody out of the softeners. Mm -hmm. Like, we use softeners so we don't feel anything. Most people, by the time they're 21 years old, have seen a million, 1.1 million commercials, and I instantly get out of pain. Wow. And so we think getting out of pain is the answer, mm -hmm. when in reality, pain drives you to change things. Mm -hmm. And so I believe you want to learn to utilize that pain. And so I use that language very precisely to jolt. And if you watch, I never call anybody names. It's not one of those type of seminars. But I use words that, like, they're not ready for. You see the whole nervous system jolt, and what that makes available is they're unconscious. Mm -hmm. And that's where you want to make permanent changes. I that couldn't be more true. I mean, it's a good point. You know, you want to use your language in a provocative way. Well, where to, where you need to be provocative, where you want to be gentle, you want to be gentle, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. So you talk also a lot about progression. I mean, the power of will and and just moving your life forward. Where does Tony Robbins, after you created so much, you've done so much for so many people, where do you want to be in the next ten years? Well, I'm a, I, I, fed a, I fed 42 million people in my lifetime. I, I was fed when I was 11 years old. My family had no food at Thanksgiving, and mm -hmm. it deeply impacted me. And I promised myself, and it was by a stranger. I don't even know who it was. Yeah. Um, they've obviously passed away because I've told the story, and no one's approached me. 
Um, but it happened when I was 11, so they're probably an older person, is my guess. Mm-hmm. But um, when I was 17, I had two families, and the next year, four, and the next year, eight. And then I had a small little company, got my employees involved, and then there was 100,000. And then for the last 14 years, I put out 2 million people a year through my foundation, and I matched it, so 4 million a year. And then I'm writing this book, um, Money Master the Game, and it's number one New York Times bestseller, but I, I interviewed 50 of the smartest people in the world financially. And while I'm interviewing these multi billionaires that started with nothing, I'm watching Congress cut food stamps. Or the SNAP program, they now call it, yeah. by almost $8 billion, which means every family who's on that would have to give up a week's worth of food every month for 12 months. Wow. And so they're hoping the private sector will jump in. Well, I've been feeding through the private sector forever. So I thought, what if I donated the whole book? You know, I got a $5 million advance for the book. It's a pretty big advance. Mm-hmm. And I said, what could I do? And they said, you could feed this many people. And then I said, I want to feed more. And then I wrote a bigger check and a bigger. So I ended up feeding 100 million people last year. And, uh, and this year, I'm going to do it again. And my goal is in five... This year, I'll be a quarter of a billion by the time I'm done, meaning total. I'll have a half a billion within five years. I want to feed a billion people within 10 years. It's a major goal for me. And I provide wow. fresh water in India for 100,000 people a day because the number one killer of children in India is waterborne diseases. Mm-hmm. so easy to solve. So I have a lot of goals of that nature. I have 18 companies. We do you know, a little over $5 billion in sales. So I have a lot of diversity in my life. And then I have four kids, mm-hmm. and grand, three grandkids, and I have my wife and my family and and then all these crazy events that I do. So I'm a, I'm a busy man. I'm not looking. There's not much. I'm not. Uh, I'm always going to be stimulated to grow. Yeah, yeah. So it's, I mean, the goal that you're setting is very high to feed the world. I mean, it's a pretty pretty strong uh, thing you you should do. Oh, I want to do it. I got the plan. Yes. You know, you mentioned your family, and that's kind of your support system, which I love to hear. I know your son Jarek is. Uh, he is a motivational speaker as well. Yes. Yeah, what and now? My dad told me. You know, a lot of life lessons. What do you, as a motivational speaker, tell your son is a life lesson? Well, you know, it's interesting. I'm not a motivational speaker, and everybody calls it that because they see, you know, 10,000 people jumping and leaping and, mm-hmm. and being in this energized state. But that's because I really believe education is normally boring as hell. Yes. And most people want the benefit of education, but they want the process. Mm-hmm. So I've made it into a concert. I've made it into entertainment, just like going to a sporting event. It's like going to a, you know, like a concert. And for Jarek, what I tried to teach him from the very beginning was that life is not about me. It's about we. When he was, uh, gosh, four years old, I remember I took him to feed people. And, you know, I was taking my friends in those days. It was Thanksgiving. We built these huge baskets and we'd feed people. And we had a few baskets left. And we went by this place that's near San Diego, Oceanside, California. There's a park there. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, there's homeless people. There's a man lying on the ground in the men's bathroom, all the junk on the ground. And he's covered up by pieces of clothing. And these baskets were beautiful. We had clothing in it and food and everything else. And Jerk was so small, the basket was bigger than he was. I said, I need to take this in. He couldn't even lift it. So I helped him kind of set it beside the man. And then all of a sudden the man reached up and grabbed my son's hand like from <laughs> sleeping. And he screamed. And I felt an inner scream. And it all went for a millisecond. And then he, this, and he went, and he kissed my son's hand. Oh, my and God. And Jarek was permanently marked by that. You know, and I'm so proud of him because he's, wow. he's, a, he's a young man of such contribution. He's always looking to give back. He's always looking to do. And I really believe that's the secret to film it. There's only so much... So much money, so much accolades, so much sex, so much anything mm-hmm. that you can feel. Ultimately, we'll have a great experience in life. We want to share it with people we love. Mm-hmm. And that's what magnifies it. And I think um, Jarek knows that. And, and he's a really, really outstanding coach. I'm really proud of him. Yeah, it's a, it's a great thing that you're creating within these people. And, and if you can give it to your son as well, I mean, well, I have, making the world a better place. I have three boys and a girl, and I'm really proud of all of them. My other son is my partner. I have a group of financial companies. I were actually about to make an announcement. We're forming, we're merging with a company. It's a twenty billion dollar firm. Oh, wow. so my son is, uh, you know, the chief marketing officer for that firm now. So he's he's been involved in all those businesses as well. So it's fun to be able to do business with my family as well. Yeah, I mean, what better team can you rely on than your family? Totally true. Um, so you've you've done all these amazing things. You've created such a life for yourself and for your family. What do you want your true legacy to be? At the end of the day, I think it's what you'll see in the film that you know that I was a man that loved people and I help people to remember who they are and to strip away anything that stopped them from having an extraordinary life, mm-hmm. life on their terms, mm-hmm. not my life, their life. And I think uh, when you watch the film, I think it's a great little capsule of what I stand for, what I'm about. And I'm, my hope is that you know, a film like that, when I pass, I've created a school of psychology. I've trained a hundred thousand therapists around the world now. Uh, I have a partner, um, Chloe Madonis, who's been rating one of the top 10 therapists for the last 30 years. She's mm-hmm. brilliant. She's made all these films. And they're instructive. It's not like this documentary. They're designed to teach coaches where to go. And so I think when I'm gone, hopefully that will continue. The skill sets that I created will continue and they'll help people to make changes much more rapidly and in a much more lasting format.
I love it. Um, so speaking of the name, I'm not your guru. Yeah. Why? Why that kind of name? Why go? Well, it was Joe's name. <laughs> he came up with it. But in the seminar, I say to people, "I'm not here to be a guru. I'm not yeah. here. I'm not here to fix you. You're not broken. Mm -hmm. I really know you're not. You may think you're broken, but I know you're not. Mm -hmm. And I'm just gonna. All I'm gonna do is be a good friend and a good coach and get you where you really want to go. I'm not looking for you to accolade or bow to me or you know all that BS that so many people have done in the past that disgusted yeah. me. Without naming names, there was a firm years ago at the, the center of that firm, the personal development area. was all He was the center of everything, and it just made me so angry. So I never want to be anything like that. I love it. Um, so I saw you also listen to a lot of music yes. to pump yourself up. I myself have a music podcast over at WGN. Oh, do you really? Yeah, it's called Sound Sessions. Oh, that's cool. And I wanted to know, what kind of music does uh, Mr. Tony Robbins get well, himself to pump himself up? I love up? everything. You know, uh, Pitbull just... I performed at my event a couple days ago just as a surprise for everybody. I love it. I it's love great. Rihanna. But I love I love some country. I love I love to mix it up. I mean mm -hmm. I love rap. Um, you know, if you ever go to one of my events, it's it's variety. Yeah. You know, I really use music as a scoring device. Like if you watch a movie without the music, it sucks. Yeah. You know, and but when you put the That's right cool. score, it's incredible. So I score everything. I believe you should score life. And so I love using music. I love that you do that. And mm -hmm. what's so nice today is like, you know, I grew up in a generation where we had Walkman. <laughs> you, know? yeah, yep. you had to really like that damn album. You went for a run. <laughs> those are the only songs you're going to hear today. We like, have everything. It's a beautiful world. Mm -hmm. So what, is a, what, are, what kind of concerts do you go to if you were going to... Well, I was just going to go to Rihanna's concert the other day. And I, unfortunately, I, I, I was in Denver and I was, it was my birthday. Yep. And, I, and they did this prize uh, birthday party, so I can't complain. <laughs> Um, but uh, I'm going to Rihanna. I'll go see who are we going to see next. Um, my wife loves uh, Krishna Das, uh, who does this incredible Indian music. We're going to go hear him. Mm -hmm. um, we'll go see. I'll go see Aerosmith still. You know, yes. Steven Tyler and those guys. Um, so you know, we, we see what, when we see something's coming, we usually kind of grab it and really go for it type of thing. I love you two still. They've been around forever, but they're still cool and shit. I still love them. Okay, very nice, very nice. Well, Tony, it was a pleasure talking to you. I can't thank you, thank you enough. Congratulations on the movie. Thank this you. is Tony Robbins. I'm not your guru. Go and check it out. Michael Heidemann with WGN Radio.